I always kind of knew that the day was coming that we'd have to discuss the concepts of enlightenment, particularly from the perspective of the great individuals of the past. And today, we are going to start with Carl Jung. We will not be really just explaining his definition. Rather, we will be going into what we might call the nitty-gritty side of things. We will explain Carl Jung's process and path, we might say, to enlightenment. Now, we will have to cover a couple basics to make sure that if anyone's stepping freshly into this, they will be able to follow along decently enough. To begin, we will make the distinction between the conscious and subconscious faculties. The conscious awareness is exactly what I just called it. It is a sense of self-awareness, a sense of self-being and an immediate interaction with someone's external environment. The subconscious faculty, however, while tending to be seen by Carl as a mix of repressed past memories and things of that nature, this is true, it can house such things, but essentially the subconscious mind, we might say, is a subliminal inscription tool. It is a hidden tier of awareness because it is constantly taking in information, much like the conscious mind. However, it is putting them, we might say, in a back burner, behind the scenes. It's just not some sphere of repressed thought. It's an ongoing influencer, we might say, upon the conscious faculty. Let's, let's take an example. Red and yellow are known to make you hungry by altering your rate of metabolism. Now, you have no real means to know this without study or test groups, yet it still works whether or not you're really aware of it. The red and yellow cause a particular, we might say, instinctive response, which, while again we're stepping into another term, Carl Jung's collective unconscious, still fit within the subconscious faculty of the individual. So, in occultism, we can see this as the impressioner or the conscious mind to shift a person's internal psyche, in other words, their unconscious mind. And this is a really common explanation for magical behaviors and practices. Now, these are typically done upon oneself to cause a greater change in kind of our, we might say, self-perception, a change in our subconscious faculty to yield an intended result, which is really the birth of the uh, fake-it-till-you-make-it mentality, surprisingly enough. However, in Jungian theory, we take a different approach. We look to reveal what was hidden. Now, that's a really big point, to reveal what was hidden and bring it into our immediate awareness which Jung himself coined the term individuation. What does it mean to bring the subconscious faculty into conscious awareness? There are a couple of methodologies, but there's one that matters most. Being aware of how the subconscious mind impacts your subconscious faculty is a major stepping stone. Now, I mean, I graduated in marketing. It's honestly our mode of study many a times. This is something that the common person is really not privy to. Now, what does that mean? What is this hidden thing? We should acknowledge a couple of common signs, or we might say instances of this. First of all, a business logo. Uh, occultly, you call this a sigil, but in a sense, a business logo actually is sigillic in nature because it is developing a presence or we might say a personification of existence from an inanimate form but it does have an effect on your subconscious mind you can look at let's say uh, just any regular business that you're accustomed to and say oh that's such and such or they sell clothes and they sell this or x or y and that is kind of the power that this inscription has on an individual. It has revealed itself to hold certain quality and content that the person's subconscious faculty is far more aware of. But it's so strong that they are still consciously aware of it via the avenue of experience. So, that is, in a sense, a way to be consciously aware of the subconscious. 
but Jung had a very special interest. And this was in the idea of certain events being unaffected and undeterred by the conscious faculty, and this was going to be dreaming. Jung seemed to believe that the nature of dreams were present within an individual to the point that they were a full revealment of their subconscious psyche, and this revealment was meant to give them insight into their internal nature, thereby assisting them in the daily world, particularly with themselves. Now that was a very roundabout way to say that Jung believed that dreams gave us some insight into how we feel and what's going on in our lives from a subconscious perspective. Not a conscious perspective, but we apply our conscious rationality to the subconscious perspective and thereby get some form of answers. But we come to the next scene. Jung also had the theory of the collective unconscious. The collective unconscious was in a sense an inheritable series of signs and symbols. Now, I don't agree with this theory. I believe that reality has a certain rigidity to it and thereby human's philosophy, as the mind is a very contained, it seems to produce similar results in similar circumstances. Therefore, man's experience and his relation to things, his creation of certain, we might say, abstractions manifest themselves as very similar symbols. Anyways, individuation was the bringing of the subconscious faculty into the conscious awareness. If a human being achieves this, Jung essentially seemed to believe that he elevated himself beyond a certain limitation of the mental faculty. In fact, from a magical perspective, we might say that the individual was completely capable of impressioning upon themselves such that their will was truth, at least from their own sense of being and immediacy with their environment. It was kind of like a power, we might say. Now, we have to keep a couple of things in mind going forward because we haven't fully touched enlightenment. Individuation doesn't necessarily tap self-actualization. Something is missing. Something not very big, but something pertinent is missing. And this is ultimately not Jung's shortcoming, but human shortcoming. The mind has long been perceived as a intricate instrument and the pulling in of the subconscious faculty to the conscious was necessary or important not only to Jung but to many a people because it has long been believed that the idea of inspiration was something that was divinely sourced. This essence, we might say, that revealed itself as inspiration, this divinely sourced concept, was rooted in a certain level of significance to the individual, but it was outside of themselves. Inspiration came from something outside of themselves. It was not strictly emotional, and it was not achieved necessarily, but it was obtained, and its obtainment through the subconscious mind. Had this a belief that the subconscious mind acted as a gateway to a certain level of reality that the conscious mind wasn't aware of, coming back around to the fact that the subconscious mind notices things that the conscious faculty does not because they are deemed unimportant. But subtleties are immensely important. If we look to alchemy, particularly the old world alchemy, the gross work is only the beginning, the subtle work is the big step to finishing one's project. So, this subtlety of expression coming into one's immediate psyche was Jung's gate to enlightenment. He believed that if you could touch upon these intricacies, that you would eventually find the deeper intricacies that were of a supernal nature, thereby finding a sense of enlightenment. Now, 
While this deals a lot with Carl Jung's idea of the collective unconscious, we must acknowledge that symbol is intrinsically related to the subconscious faculty, hence the example that I gave you earlier about logos. So, on the matter of symbolism, we must acknowledge one thing, and it's man's willingness, we might say, to divine himself. This is because a very special scenario. What was man's first symbol? Many people say that man's first symbol is a dot. And this is because when we might say a caveman, who in his expression took some sort of means of painting or inscription, first made a single point. If he took an inscription tool, he cut into it and that was a point. If he took some sort of die, he touched his finger to it, and that was a point. It did not matter in which direction he pulled it, that was a line. However, man's first symbol was in fact himself. It was the creative agent of those symbols and signs. It was the, we might say, mental form that predated the very act. And this is what would eventually become, to some degree, man's conception of the divinity. And to be that creative nature, as many human beings already are, is pre-theological essence of divinity. Anyways, this has been River at the Nimiton, and I thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time. And a massive thank you to my patrons and supporters. I appreciate you more than you know.